Hello, and welcome to the Healthy Brain Research Network's webinar, which is a discussion of editors, a panel of editors from a variety of aging journals in the field. The editors that we have with us today, next slide please. Our, our first presenter today is Dr. Joseph Galger. He is the editor of the Journal of Applied Gerontology. Dr. Galger is a long-term care professor in nursing, the director of graduate studies at the Center on Aging at the University of Minnesota. Our second presenter today will be Dr. Rebecca Allen. Dr. Allen is the editor for the Americas of the Aging and Mental Health Journal. She is a professor of clinical psychology at Alabama's Research Institute on Aging at the University of Alabama. Our third presenter today is Dr. Rachel Pruchnow. Dr. Pruchnow is the editor-in-chief of The Gerontologist. She is an endowed professor of gerontology at the Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine. Next slide, please. My name is Dr. Lisa McGuire. I am lead of CDC's Healthy Aging Program, and I will be your moderator today. Next slide. So before we begin, just a few housekeeping things. So if you have questions at any point today during the presentations, please hover down at the very bottom of your screen and you will see a Q&A button and it looks like a file folder with a Q on it. Please click there and type your question and your question will either be entered in writing or answered in writing by one of the presenters or we will go through the questions during the moderated question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Please note that our webinar today will be recorded and the recording will be made available. All registrants will be sent a link um, to all and are welcome to distribute it as well too. So we'll go ahead and start today with our first presenter, um, Dr. Joseph Galger. Well, thanks so much, Lisa. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks so much to all of you for attending here today. I think we'll see and hear a lot of great perspectives related to disseminating our research and particularly disseminating our peer-reviewed research in various types of scientific outlets. So, uh, what I wanted to do today was to talk about uh, selecting a journal and what are some of the tips, I guess, that I've learned and have tried to practice really from three different perspectives. One, certainly as editor of the Journal of Applied Gerontology, which I've been since 2011 and I'll be ending my term or two ter second term specifically on July 1st this year. Um, but then also as member of various editorial boards um, and finally, certainly as an author myself. Um, and I, I guess this is a essentially collated wisdom that I've come across over the, the past several or a couple decades at least that I've been uh, conducting research. So next slide, please. Oh, am I controlling the slide? Sorry. Okay, I didn't realize that. Okay, great. Whoops. Okay, so um, first I wanted to talk about selecting a journal and addressing some of the questions that were posed and, uh, you know, really thinking about each of these. Um, you know, first and foremost, you know, the, one of the questions we wanted to, to talk about today is how do you select the most appropriate journal for a manuscript? Um, it seems a fairly straightforward question, but sometimes a little more nuanced than one would think in terms of identifying the right fit for your particular uh, uh, study. Second, how do we learn about what journal topics are being sought out in order to prevent wasting time submitting to different ones and hope that, that one will be accepted? Um, so thinking about, again, uh, trying to be efficient, not only on our behalf, uh, in terms of identifying a, a, an outlet that's most appropriate, but then also perhaps also trying to avoid wasting the time, not only of the editors and editorial staff, but then eventually of reviewers as well. This other question, which certainly is posed to me quite a bit, are editors willing to review abstracts to assess suitability of the topic for publication? The fourth question, which I think actually cross cuts much more than just qualitative work, but really thinking from a methodological perspective, what is the kind of work that certain journals publish? Um, 
you know, in terms of thinking about specific reviewers, is that worthwhile to identify? And again, that certainly varies journal by journal, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the last question I wanted to address here was how important is ranking and the impact factor? How do we navigate these rankings when submitting manuscripts? And we'll talk a little bit about that too in my presentation. So first, um, thinking about that initial question, selecting a journal and, and how do we pick the right journal? One of the things I think that's really important to do, and sometimes we often don't do this as authors, uh, is first and foremost is really reviewing the scope and mission of the journal. Now, certainly when we go to a journal webpage or even review, say, the hard copy masthead of a journal, you know, sometimes we may give short shrift to the idea that uh, actually reviewing the scope and mission isn't important, that that's just kind of a filler. And in fact, if we review table of contents over a certain period of time or over a certain period of issues, that'll give us a good understanding of what the scope and mission of the journal is. Now, while that's important, I still think it is critical to, to review the scope and mission of the journal in terms of how the journal describes itself and how it positions itself. I know as editor for the Journal of Applied Gerontology, I, I did take some time to revise and update the scope and mission of, of, of the journal to ensure that we were basically uh, positioning the journal in such a way that it would attract the kind of submissions that we felt were the best fit. Now, that being said, I do see with many, many authors when I'm screening manuscripts upon submission that they clearly don't review the scope and mission of the journal. They're submitting papers that really aren't a great fit for our uh, particular outlet. And to me, if, if authors had reviewed the scope and mission at the first place, they would have uh, submitted papers that were more appropriate. The second tip I provided here is identify similarly focused research published recently or during the tenure of the current editor in, in your candidate journal. You know, First and foremost, I think it's important to, when identifying similar research that's been published in a given journal, you want to make sure that that maps on to the current editor and the current editor's tenure. Because certainly, certain editors may have a, a particular affinity for a certain type of work versus others, and you want to be cognizant of that when selecting a particular journal for your particular work. Um, the, the next point, too, I think is really important is, now many journals have taken to, if not forcing, candidate authors strongly encouraging authors to cite work that's been published recently in the journal. Now, to be honest, a lot of the times this is for the purposes of the journal to increase its own impact factor, but above and beyond that, one thing I know I try to do as an author, and one way I try to determine, and I use to determine whether my work is relevant for a given uh, uh, journal, is to see has work been published previously or at least recently in this particular journal that I can then meaningfully cite in my particular manuscript. Because I think then that helps in a way answer this question that you may have of, is my paper actually uh, appropriate for a given journal? Um, getting at one of the other questions, but uh, this is something else I thought about, is ascertaining whether the methodological framework of your study aligns with the candidate journal. And when I say methodological framework, it's thinking about things like, how much does this given journal emphasize theory or conceptual frameworks? Some journals really expect you to have a theory or at least a conceptual framework to more or less ground your study and proceed accordingly. Other journals uh, may not really emphasize theory or conceptual frameworks that much, but nonetheless, I think that's important to know, does a given uh, journal emphasize these types of methodological facets. And certainly when we think of methodology, we can think of things like designs, design types and frameworks as well. Certain journals may be more comfortable with publishing and disseminating uh, methodological approaches such as randomized controlled trials, whereas others may not so much. Um, and that certainly then dictates the types of methods a given journal is, is uh, comfortable with. So this led me to think too about the question that was posed related to qualitative research, or more importantly, or I don't think more importantly, but relatedly mixed methods as well. Um, some journals provide a, a welcome uh, research that is more qualitative in orientation or mixed methods as well. Um, and in some cases, and some of the subsequent presenters may address this, some of these journals actually provide uh, more lenient word limits to feature or welcome this type of work. Other journals, however, such as clinical journals in some disciplines, aren't as open to mixed methods or simply are, have a very firm word limit that makes it very difficult to publish qualitative or mixed methods research of a given rigor. Um, again, reviewing the scope and mission of the journal, certainly reviewing the instruction to authors and guidelines to authors is important and informative in this regard. Now, that being said, 
certain disciplines, I'm thinking of nursing, for example, and there, there are others as well, even clinical nursing journals certainly are open to qualitative and mixed methods research. However, as an author, it will take a fair amount of work, I would argue, to condense and craft a rigorous qualitative or mixed method article to fit sometimes within these more uh, restrained uh, uh, word limits or formatting guidelines. Um, and then I think I've just addressed this, ascertain whether the formatting standards influence the quality of your manuscript. This, this certainly feeds into what we've just talked about here. So in terms of journal topics sought, uh, you know, calls for papers, special issues on journal websites, this, current, this is probably the easiest way for an author to determine whether a candidate journal has interest in the, partic the, the particular topic that one study is uh, emphasizing. Uh, as we've talked about here multiple times, you know, reviewing the scope and mission statement of the journal is, is really important to determine whether the, a particular topic of interest is one that will fit uh, the scope of a, of a given journal as well. Now, in terms of my own experience as editor of the Journal of Applied Gerontology, I, I've always seen myself first and foremost as a gatekeeper of quality. Um, so I screen all manuscripts when they're submitted to determine first and foremost, not only is their rigor appropriate and our, is their quality meet the standards of our journal, but secondly, does a given article fit our journal? So certainly for the Journal of Applied Gerontology, a big point of emphasis given the title of the journal is the research that's disseminated in our journal must have some type of application, whether that's clinical application, it could certainly have conceptual theoretical application, policy relevance, et cetera, it must have that emphasis and that emphasis must be stated clearly. If a study is uh, submitted and doesn't emphasize that, right away, I'm, I'm more likely than not, I'm gonna screen that out. We make this very clear in the scope and mission statement of the journal. We certainly make it clear in terms of the prior work that's been published in the, in the journal. But again, some authors, for whatever reasons, don't seem to acknowledge that or don't pay attention. And when that happens, the, the likelihood of their article being screened out goes up exponentially. Um, this idea of policing of topics to me really depends on the scope of a journal. Some journals tend to, I guess, be much more narrow in terms of the types of topics they're willing to grapple with. This really depends on the journal. It may also depend on the particular discipline that you want to disseminate in. I know certainly for the Journal of Applied Gerontology, I don't really police certain topics per se. I really don't even police the types of methodology that's submitted per se. I just tend to focus more on the overall scope and fit of the articles that are being submitted as well as their overall quality. Keeping that in mind, that is what more or less I base my decisions on in terms of uh, allowing a manuscript to go to the next step of peer review. This is a question that I've come that has come up, it certainly has crossed my desk quite a bit, is this idea of editors willingness to review abstracts prior to submission. I think some editors are open to this. In my experience as an author, to be honest, I haven't found editors to be very open or welcoming of this per se. For example, submitting an abstract and saying, uh, dear editor so-and-so, will this actually fit in your journal? What do you think? Is this a good uh, potential uh, uh, study to submit to your journal? I get this question an awful lot as editor of Journal of Applied Gerontology. I'm assuming uh, Becky and Rachel as well may have given their journals and the number of submissions to theirs. To be honest, I often just give this stock answer uh, because I, at one at certain point I got kind of tired of answering it as an editor because I got it so much. Is basically kind of reinforcing what we've talked about here today. I encourage you as an author to review the recently published articles as well as the submission guidelines on our webpage and then you should be able to determine if your paper fits the scope of our journal. Um, that by and large is how I approach these questions as now editor. And you know, as author, before I was editor, I, one would think, well, editors should be more open to answering these questions. But then once I became editor, I got this question so much um, that basically I just decided to provide the stock answer as my go-to to, to more or less be efficient and save time. Um, and so again, as author, I think it's an implicit upon you to do the legwork to determine if your paper is appropriate for a given journal. I think some of the tips we've uh, described and uh, elucidated here earlier would be uh, a, good, a good strategy to employ. I'm, I'm gonna conclude my section here on the importance and navigation of impact factors. Uh, I provided this link here um, in terms of where to find impact factors for journals in your given area. 
Uh, certainly many journals themselves publish their impact factor and ranking within the category or within their given category directly on their home pages. Um, I think Aging and Mental Health does that. I know the Gerontologist does that. The Journal of Applied Gerontology does that as well. The journal citation reports often are available vis-a-vis -vis library subscription. That's how I usually access it through the University of Minnesota. Um, your institution would likely have access to this as well. So is impact factor important as an author? In brief, it is. Um, certainly in academic context, many tenure and promotion committees will use this information when trying to gauge the quality of uh, the work disseminated by a given author. Certainly publication or journal of higher impact factor always leads to greater exposure for a citation by other author articles and authors. And that, of course, is another metric that is often used to gauge what is the quality of a given paper that's submitted? Um, how many times has it been cited by, by other authors and other articles? Now, that being said, there are by no means universal indicators of quality or impact of the given article. You know, the question posed to me was dealing with the impact factor, but then there now are new author level indicators as well. There's the H metric, for example, which is basically used to determine what is the overall impact of a given author in terms of the number of times they've been cited, for example. There's even new metrics that have been developed. For example, the alt metric, which takes into account not just cross citation, but then also things like downloads, social media mentions, etc. So for those of you that may perhaps are in non-academic context or maybe want to seek out different ways to gauge the impact of your work, uh, a metric like alt metric may be actually more important to you than H metric or even impact factors or cross citations are. In the end, in general, how is this journal viewed in your field? Um, sometimes I think a, a, an apt metaphor when I think of journals is sometimes it's almost like uh, car, deal, car makers in the auto industry. Um, certain journals um, may have, are, are viewed qualitatively in a certain way, even given maybe some of their more quantitative factors have taken a dip or aren't as high. Sometimes certain journals have a certain prestige that's important to remember and to consider when you're thinking about submitting it. Um, and then finally, I think as an author, and one thing I do look at as well, because, you know, not all of my work sometimes goes in the absolute top highest tier journal. Um, does the journal offer articles that I publish in it enough exposure where, for example, in key scientific databases, for me, PubMed is important, for you it may be another, where authors can find the work and then can cite it and judge it on its own merits. In this day and age, particularly this digital age, where we're rapidly moving away from the importance of print publication to digital publication and digital distribution and accessibility, oftentimes as an author, I think it's, it's important to have authors access your particular article vis-a-vis -vis trusted resources, trusted scientific databases, and then once that happens, authors kind of vote with their feet per se. They will cite your article and determine its quality, whether it, in terms of them citing it, et cetera. I think that's as important as well, as well as determining the overall journal's impact factor. So that concludes my slides here. Elisa, when I don't know if we're gonna take questions now, we're gonna take them after at the end. Okay, Joe, yes, we're going to take questions at the end. Okay. Um, if you do have a question for Dr. Gallagher for this excellent presentation, go down to the bottom of the screen, hover, you will see a black bar appear, and click in the, the Q&A button, and you can type your question for Dr. Gallagher. Um, he can either answer them while he's listening to the other presentations, or we'll discuss them at the end. So thank you once again, Joe, excellent presentation. Great. Our next presenter today is Dr. Rebecca Allen, and she's going to give us her insights as editor of Aging and Mental Health. Well, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Am I coming through? You sound great. We're just waiting for the slides to switch. Outstanding. Okay, well, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today and with this um, esteemed panel. And thank you for the invitation. Um, so my job was to talk with you a bit about preparing your manuscript for submission. Um, and so I'm gonna go through some strategies for how to make your paper more publishable. And then um, all of this is couched under the rubric of mentorship. Um, and I start all of my talks with a quote. Uh, as a first-generation scholar myself, perhaps some of you also are first-generation scholars, 
I found this quote from Joshua Marine, challenges are what make life interesting and overcoming them is what makes life meaningful. So publishing your work is of course uh, a challenge, but um, it is well worth the reward. Okay. And so I am clicking a number of different buttons and um, nothing seems to be moving forward. Is, I am controlling and I'm clicking on my mouse and the arrow keys. Okay, there's some weirdness. I understand um, now what the problem is. Okay. So um, in terms of the objectives, you know, first we're going to go through what you need to know about successful manuscript preparation, um, communicating with journal editors, and I'm sure that um, Joe and Rachel will have input in that as well, what you need to know before you submit. Very briefly, as a specific example for those of you out there who may be early in your training, we'll go through a, an overview of manuscript submission um, process at Aging and Mental Health. And then just a bit on um, peer review and mentorship and laying the groundwork for long-term um, publication success or dissemination of your work. Okay, so um, the first thing really to keep in mind is that uh, when you submit your manuscript, you are creating a first impression. So the first submission does have meaning and creates a relationship of sorts with the editor and with the reviewers if you get past the editorial review stage. Um, as such, then, your cover letter matters. So know who the editor is. Uh, after you've selected your journal, as, as uh, Dr. Gaugler discussed with us, it's important to sort of get to know um, the scope and the editorial board uh, of the journal that you've selected for the uh, potential publication of your work. Also know how um, your manuscript fills a gap in the literature, particularly as it relates to publication in that journal outlet, again, as uh, Dr. Gaugler mentioned. And then another um, aspect of, of how to make your paper more publishable is, like I say, attention to detail. So your references matter. Um, when, when you submit your manuscript, be mindful of the uh, journal's guidelines. Um, not only do uh, word limits and figure limits count and the types of articles that might be published, qualitative, quantitative, or mixed, but pay attention to whether the journal asks for references in uh, APA or AMA format. Also, um, be careful if you're using referencing software. Don't automatically assume that um, EndNote or RefWorks or um, whatever you may be using has correctly placed your references in your manuscript. Uh, oftentimes, there will be a additional initial or other um, things that will creep in, in, in if you rely solely on the software. Okay, so um, in communicating with journal edit editors, uh, know what's needed. Um, and know about peer review and mentorship as it is the groundwork for long-term success. Okay, um, so before you submit, be sure to um, have input from your writing team. Most science these days, of course, is collaborative and most of us are writing in collaborative teams. Um, read your paper over and over again, that's gonna count, uh, catch those odd little mistakes or typos that may creep in, like if you're using reference software. Um, make it pithy, even though cutting material may feel like cutting off your finger. As uh, Joe discussed, word limits and figure limits and table limits matter. They are important. Um, also, Aging and Mental Health is an international journal, and so it's very helpful for everyone particularly for those who uh, may not speak English as a first language, or again, for first generation scholars, have others 
uh, who are not on your writing team review your paper and provide feedback before submission. Um, it's sort of a, a gentle peer review when you ask your friends to review your work and that will catch things that you may not um, be aware of or may have overlooked in the reading and rereading. Okay. So we said that interprofessional teams do create better manuscripts. Um, and I said that about international journals, and I said that about first generation scholars. Okay. So these are just screenshots, again, as an example, certainly um, Journal of Applied Gerontology and the Gerontologist are outstanding uh, journals in our field. This is just um, FYI for those of you who may be newer to the publication process. So this is a screenshot of Scholar One portal for submitting an article to Aging and Mental Health. Um, so you have created a an account for yourself and then in terms of actually submitting um, you know you have to go through begin submission if you are using EndNote uh, then you have an EndNote submission but trust me the website will not catch um, all of the problems that you may encounter so be careful um, then the first step would be entering, of course, your um, what kind of manuscript you're submitting for aging and mental health. It may be an original article. You could be submitting a review or systematic review or narrative review letter to the editor or editorial. And then, of course, you have to input your title. And so my title here is how to submit a manuscript to aging and mental health. And then, of course, you enter your abstract. And I say here, this is really important as it may be the only thing that your reader ever reads once you get past publication. Uh, you want to be able to communicate in 250 words or less what you have found and how your work adds to the literature, fills that gap. Um, each journal has its own format for abstracts, but generally they're about 250 words. Now, selecting your keywords is a very important step. And at Aging and Mental Health, we do have a um, drop down box, as you see there. We submit and uh, we publish quite a bit of work on dimension cognitive disorders, interventions, um, memory impairment, mild cognitive impairment, all of those things. We're also um, very open to qualitative and mixed method research. Usually those are gonna be longer manuscripts. <clears throat> we're also um, developing an emphasis in palliative and end of life care and would be very happy to receive uh, manuscript submissions in that topic area. And then you enter your author information. So I'm corresponding author. You add all of the different authors um, in your writing team. Then you have the opportunity to select reviewers. And one of the questions that um, was posed to the panel is how to select reviewers when asked. Um, so what you want to do is to, you can um, type in people, people that you would like to have review your manuscript, and then you would potentially type in people, people that you do not want to have um, review your manuscript by typing in uh, our friend and colleague, Dr. Lisa McGuire. I actually do want her to review my manuscripts, um, although that says oppose reviewers. So think of carefully about the individuals who are familiar with the line of research, others who have published in that line of research, and others who would uh, render a fair and useful review. Those are the people that you want to suggest as potential reviewers for your manuscript. But of course, that decision is um, in the hands of the editor. And so you can make suggestions and they may or may not be followed. Okay. <coughs> Here's where you have the opportunity to upload your cover letter and remember um, the editor will see your cover letter, so, uh, you know, don't submit a cover letter um, to, say, um, Journal of Aging and Health, 
not represented here today, and then forget if that manuscript doesn't make in that particular journal and send the same cover letter to Aging and Mental Health because we're not the same editorial team. Be sure and change the name of the editor to whom you're uh, addressing your correspondence. Okay, and then you indicate whether or not your work is funded, um, and then you have several questions, sort of a um, check on um, ethics check and attention check. Um, has this manuscript been submitted previously to this journal? That's very important because if you're submitting your revision at Aging and Mental Health, um, and I've been uh, an associate editor since 2012, editor just since January 2017, we try to only send manuscripts out for one round of review um, externally, and then the editors try their best to handle revisions um, on their own so that revisions are more rapidly um, processed in the system. So that question about whether or not you've submitted previously to the journal is integral in um, getting your manuscript pretty much in the right place within the Scholar One system. Then you have these attention questions confirm the following, um, solely submitted to this journal, um, you know, in compliance with ethical guidelines, etc. And then um, journals will publish special sections and typically you would uh, be approached to participate in a special section by a guest editor for any given journal. Um, and so if you are working with a team on a special section, you would indicate that here, yes, this manuscript is a part of a special section, or no, I'm just submitting um, in general to aging and mental health. And uh, as a mentorship moment for uh, those of you out there, it is always a good thing to participate in um, special sections of journals. They are frequently, um, more heavily read and cited. And so when you have that opportunity, consider carefully if you want to take part in it. Here's also where you indicate the number of figures, number of tables, and number of words, um, and number of pages of your manuscript. Again, it's very important to pay attention to those uh, word and figure limits for your particular journal with the knowledge that qualitative and mixed method manuscripts are frequently more lengthy. Then it's time to upload your file. And um, after you upload your file, you want to um, compile it and you'll be prompted um, prior to actual submission to review your uh, PDF and be very careful about that. Typically, there's not a problem um, as long as you're uploading a manuscript in Word format, say. Um, but always check at the end of the process of manuscript submission to be certain that nothing has gone wonky and you've gotten some kind of odd visual in your manuscript um, or that you, know, you accidentally hit um, manuscript not for review as opposed to manuscript for review. Manuscripts often have blind review so that you prepare a manuscript without the names of the authors. Um, and the manuscript without the names of the authors would be what would go out for review. Okay. So that's just a very quick overview of uh, manuscript submission at one of our prestigious gerontology journals. Just a brief note on um, mentorship, um, because mentorship is important for all of us. Hopefully we receive and provide mentorship throughout our careers um, for those who have more experience. Uh, put up the definition of mentorship by Zerzen, a symbiotic relationship aimed at advancing careers and career satisfaction for both the mentor and mentee. These relationships should be dynamic, collaborative, and reciprocal, and focused on the mentee's personal and professional development. It's always a good idea to seek mentorship both inside and outside one's own personal um, 
proximal work environment. Uh, for example, participation in this webinar today is um, participating in some mentorship that's more distal. Um, probably many of you are not at any of our uh, given institutions as members of the panel. And then in terms of learning how to write, um, for those of you who are earlier in your careers, really kind of step up and reach out to those who have more experience. Many um, labs in psychology, nursing, and public health and other fields work in research vertical teams. So approach students or uh, other people who are somewhat farther along in their career and ask if you can help with any um, manuscripts. Here, uh, we typically have first year graduate students work on a first year project, which is um, in collaboration with someone else on the team. And we all have way more data and way more writing projects than we can get out into the world ourselves. So we are happy for the help. And these relationships you form, number four, will forge the ties that will follow you the rest of your career and allow you to um, continue to collaborate with these individuals and teams. So we have gone through our objectives, what you need to know about successful manuscript submission, communicating with journal edical editors, what you need to know before you submit. We've gone through an overview of the manuscript submission process at Aging and Mental Health, just as an example. And we've talked about peer review and mentorship, laying the groundwork for success. And so remember too, that um, all of us have to start somewhere and submitting a successful manuscript may seem impossible until it is done. Take some comfort in all of these fine individuals on this slide who have accomplished great things. Thank you much and now pay forward anything of value that I have presented here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen, and I just want to echo the value of a mentorship uh, it, through your student part of your career and through all stages of your career. Everybody can benefit from having a mentor and being a good mentor because those people who are your mentors, you will remember them forever and, um, and they really are very meaningful and help shape our lives. So thank you once again, Dr. Allen. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rachel Pruchno, uh, the editor of The Gerontologist, and she's going to share some additional wisdom and insight. And while we're getting the slides up for Dr. Pruchno, once again, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the, the question button at the bottom of your screen in black. Dr. Pruchno, I'm turning it over to you. Great, thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and it's really fun hearing um, the uh, the other two editors talk. I, I feel sort of like you know Macy's learning Gimbal's secrets. It's kind of fun, um, and I, I I hope that the, the rest of the panel has learned um, a lot, and, and I have learned a lot too. I just want to comment before I talk uh, do, do, go through my slides. Um, you know what I'm what I'm sort of coming away with as I'm hearing these other um, editors talk is there are lots and lots of differences in the, the gerontology journals. So um, I, for example, um, I, I, I will take a look at manus at abstracts before um, they're submitted um, and, and do that often. It, does, it doesn't bother me. So, so you know, it, it, we all have our individual differences, but, you know, it's sort of, I, I guess the, the bottom line is don't be afraid to ask. The worst that can happen is you get a note like, you know, like, like Joe does and saying, well, you know, I, I really can't do it. But you, you also might get a, a response that says, um, no, this does not. This is not appropriate for this journal, and so that really saves you a little bit of time. So it doesn't hurt to ask, I, I, I think. Um, and and unlike Becky, I never read cover letters. Um, I, my, my my philosophy is that the manuscript needs to stand on its own, and and I don't really care if you can write a nice letter. Um, so again, individual differences. Um, uh, and, and again, you know, I, I heard Becky talking about um, they like to do one review. Uh, it, it's the, the norm for TG is two and sometimes three back and forth between the author and the reviewer. So um, again, individual differences, and, and that's what you know makes the world go round. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, tell you what I'm going to do uh, this afternoon is, is talk a little bit. I want to give you a little bit of an introduction to the gerontologist since I'm not familiar with who all is listening. Um, because I think that understanding um, the journal will help you understand um, some of the comments that I'm going to make later in my talk about 
increase how do you increase the odds for for um, uh, successful successfully publishing so let's see which arrows work page uh, they don't seem to be working on this and I could not I cannot advance Lisa um, why don't you just say next slide and then Gwen can advance them for you Rachel okay next slide Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the 2016 um, TG submissions. Next slide. Um, so as you can see, um, in uh, last year, 2016, we received 815 um, submissions. That's a lot, and our journal keeps growing and growing. When I took over um, as editor in 2011, there were 472. So um, this year we will double double where we were in 2011. So. Um, I think that um, what we're seeing in not only the gerontologist, but in, in probably every journal is just this explosion in the number of manuscripts, um, which is why it's going to be really important for you to understand rejection. And we'll talk about that. And, and what do you do about it? And, 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 and how do you respond? Uh, next slide. So again, just to orient you a little bit to the gerontologist, um, the majority of articles that we receive are research articles, but we also receive a lot of um, um, we have we have other types of articles. We have um, intervention articles that we used to call practice concepts. We're now calling them intervention articles. Um, we have international spotlights. We have policy articles. Um, we have forums. So so one of the you know if, if there's one bit of advice that I can give to people, the most important thing is to read the instructions to authors. Um, and it's amazing how people don't read the instructions to authors. Um, because sort of like all the clues that you want to know about the journal are there and they're in black and white and they're on the web and nobody reads them. Um, and, and we also, the, our editorial offices are always updating them. Um, so if you're smart, you really, I mean, I think a lot of what both uh, Joe and Becky said, um, the, the bottom line is read the instructions to authors um, and, you know, know, know your journal. Okay, next. So again, in uh, 2016, this will just give you an idea of um, what happens to the, 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 the initial decision that, that is made by an editor. Um, and, and you can see here that um, I reject, my, my journal, that the gerontologist rejects um, about 60% of the manuscripts that we get. They are not sent out for review. And we do it, and, I, and, and one of the things I'm very proud of is that we do it quickly. So we don't torture people for, for too long. If, if the manuscript is not appropriate for the gerontologist, we let you know. And, and I feel like that's fair because, because then you can go and find another journal and, you know, perhaps a better fit or, um, uh, you know, a, a, a journal that makes more sense. But I, I want you to, to, to remember that 60% of the manuscripts are rejected out of hand. Um, and again, that's going to, as I talk about some of the slides in, in late, later in my presentation, um, you'll understand. I, I want you to be able to put this in context. Next. Um, okay, so um, manuscripts are sent uh, that are sent out. Um, they th there are initial decisions made on these manuscripts, um, and you can see the majority of them, 52%, are revised and resubmit. Um, about 40%, though, are rejected after they are reviewed by reviewers. So the big message here is if you ever submit something to the gerontologist and to probably to any journal and it comes back, revise and resubmit, you should celebrate. I think most young scholars get a revise and resubmit and they say, oh, that's terrible. Um, on the contrary, that is something to celebrate. Go out and buy the champagne and, and, and celebrate because that, that, that tells you uh, you'll get some really encouraging um, feedback from reviewers and, and it tells you that the manuscript has a chance if you act appropriately. Okay, next. Uh, so this slide shows you the final decisions that are made for manuscripts that are sent out for peer review. Um, in, in, in the end, 39% are accepted and 45% 40, are, are um, rejected. At the time this was the slide was made, there were some in, um, in the system that were pending. Next. 
Um, what you see here, the, the, the acceptance rate and time to make final decisions, um, again, for the gerontologist last year. Um, the aver average days to make all decisions is about 33 days. Of course, it takes longer to accept a manuscript, about 120 days, than to reject it, about 47 days. And that's because what we typically do is we um, send the manuscript back and forth between the reviewers and the, um, the author. Um, and you know, at each point in time, um, as editor or, or any of my associate editors are um, um, making decisions in response to uh, comments that are made by the reviewers. Um, so just this, this slide is important here because what this shows you is that um, of all the manuscripts that we received, um, that we had made a final decision on, 17% are accepted. So that's not a lot. Okay, next slide. Um, and here's a, just another way of looking at our acceptance rate. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, our acceptance rate has been it, it was steady for a while and has been coming down. And as the number of manuscripts that we receive increases, we are, be, my team is being encouraged by our, our publisher, OUP, to get tougher. They keep telling me I have to get tougher, get tougher, get tougher, because um, we, we just can't, we can't publish everything that we get. So I guess, again, this is a good problem. The quality of the science is increasing. That's great. But then for authors, the, um, the acceptance rate is declining. OK, next. OK, uh, and here you can see the US. I'm going to show you US submissions um, by year again, like, like um, Aging and Mental Health. Um, uh, we are an international journal. And what's interesting here is that our uh, US submissions have been declining. Um, over time, about 47% last year were, were submissions um, by uh, people from the U.S. Next slide. And we have we we have been attracting manuscripts from a host of countries, and that's really exciting. Um, 432 of our manuscripts were from um, international authors. Next slide. But here's the sad so here's the sad news. Um, the acceptance rate by international authors is very, very small. Last year, only 4.6% of um, the uh, international submissions were accepted. And I'm, I'm sure you can you know, imagine why that might be. Um, there, there, are, there are scientific issues, but there are also language issues. And I think all journals really struggle to, to deal with, you know, how do we deal with we, want, we all want to have, uh, we all want to be international, we want to attract um, good scholars from throughout the world, um, but if they can't write in English, that, that creates a huge problem. Next slide. Um, this slide shows you some of the top keywords from the gerontologist uh, for last year. As you can see, um, you know, informal caregiving, dementia, long-term care, cognition, health, depression, um, some of our, our more popular keywords. And again, this, this sort of speaks to know your journal. Next slide. And here's a slide of our impact factor that I'm not really going to focus on. So let's go to the next slide. And, and, and here we're going to talk a little bit about um, increasing the odds that your manuscript will be published. Next slide. So first I want to say you're only human. Um, and so here, here's, here's a, a truism. Anyone who has ever published has been rejected. And, and here's a part in my talk when I, when I do this talk for, in front of an audience, um, I typically will ask the senior scholars in the room, um, have you ever been, have you ever had a manuscript rejected? Um, and everybody raises their hand. So um, rejection is part of this game. Um, rejection hurts, and it, but it's part of the scientific process. Next slide. So you get a letter from me, um, and it says, thank you for submitting your manuscript entitled, this is the most important finding ever to the gerontologist. While the manuscript addresses an important topic, I'm sorry to tell you that I'm unable to send this out to peer review. So this is telling you there, there, there is something wrong with this manuscript, and it's not even getting off of my desk. And you're really, really mad, and you hate me. Um, next slide. So let's talk about some fixable problems, because when I reject a manuscript out of hand, I always tell authors why. Um, and I, I, I know that's not typical of all, author, uh, all um, editors, but I feel like 
um, authors work really hard to, you know, develop their manuscript and, and submit it and, and get through the Scholar One process and, and, and submit it. Um, so, so, you know, I feel like they, they need an explanation for why. Um, and, and believe me, I have had, I have submitted articles to um, some journals and I just get back this, thank you, it, you know, we're, we're, it, I can't send it out for review and there's no explanation. So I, I feel like that's kind of useless. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these fixable problems. Next, yeah. So the primary reason uh, for my decision is your manuscript. I guess you gotta do it, hit next. Okay, so this is my favorite. I could do this one in my sleep. Manuscript lacks a conceptual framework and a set of testable hypotheses. So if, if the first thing I do when I get a manuscript is I, I read it through quickly um, and I'm looking for a conceptual framework and a set of hypotheses and if it's not, then, then I don't send it out. That's that's one of my pet peeves. Um, that that that, that it, it needs to be science, and it needs to be um, there needs to be a hypothesis, right? So the solution is you find one. You develop a you, you you probably had a conceptual framework, and you probably had a hypothesis in mind when you were developing this manuscript. But you got to tell the reader what it is. So so that's that's easy to to find that right to figure to find one. Next, okay, <clears throat> so. This is a big one. Um, the gerontologist follows APA format, and if I get a manuscript and the references and all, all are in AMA format, you know, I know really very quickly that you've submitted to someplace else, and you didn't even bother to read the instructions to authors and know that it needs to be in APA format. So that's that strike. Um, so very easy to fix. You know, get your APA manual out and fix it. Next. Not consistent with the mission of our journal. Again, you didn't read the instructions to authors and you're sending me something about cell biology. So the solution is find the right journal for, you, for your work. So um, the manuscript is poorly written and confusing, includes numerous grammatical problems. Um, again, if you listen to Becky, um, you, you wouldn't be doing this. It's, it's really important to, to you know, write clearly and um, you know, this has, uh, unfortunately, um, we, we, we have a scholar who's not English speaking, you know, it's, it's, it's more and more, it's, it's more difficult. I could not write a paper in, Chi in Chinese, or, you know, in Mandarin, nor could I write a, a paper in German. Um, but, you know, this is sort of the playing field. If you're publishing in the gerontologist, it, it, the English needs to be understandable. Um, so what do you do about it? Well, you engage an editor or a colleague. Next, yeah. Or you hire a translator. Now, this can be expensive. Um, and of course, there's no guarantees. So, so typically, if if I can, if the English, especially if we're talking about a, a non-English speaking author, um, if I can understand the manuscript and get through it and not get waylaid by the words, um, I, I usually will uh, will send it out um, and let it go under review. And um, one of the things that we have done with with the gerontologist is that um, we have a couple of people on our board who you know, do their service to the journal by helping to, um, in a sense, translate, um, work to work with authors to, you know, we do this only with manuscripts that are, the content is ready to accept, but it's rough. Then we have one of our translators work with the author to, 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 to sort of polish it. Um, and we've done this a few times, you know, I think every year, maybe once or twice. Um, so it's not something we're doing for everybody, but, but it's once we get the science, um, understandable that, that we do that. Okay, next. Um, so some more serious problems. Go ahead, yeah. So the, 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 the manuscript's based on a small volunteer sample or the measures aren't, uh, have low reliability, adds little to the literature, uses an inappropriate or flawed research design. Um, there you really can't do much about it. You know, it's, it's sort of dead in the water. Um, uh, so, you know, but, the, the other thing I want to say is that these manuscripts that are rejected, that are desk rejects, um, people ask me sometimes, well, can I fix these things and resubmit it? The answer is you can fix these things and then you can submit it as a new manuscript, but you can't, re you, you can't do a revise and resubmit. A revise and resubmit is by invitation only, if you will. <clears throat> so let's talk about revise and resubmit. Next slide. Okay, so this manuscript entitled Really Important Science um, has re been reviewed. I invite you to revise and resubmit. And so you get from, from, from the uh, reviewers, from both of the, review the reviewers or two or three reviewers, you get comments. Um, so this is the most valuable 
piece of this is what peer review is the most exciting wonderful thing that we've got going on for us in science um, what you get here is you get you get two people in your field um, to read your work and to give you comments and they don't even charge you for it it's just it's just amazing um, next slide so um, the, the reviewers might suggest that you clarify the conceptual framework or that you add particular details or that there are problems with the analysis. Um, so they're going to be very clear um, about what's wrong. They're not just, they're just not going to say, well, it needs to be fixed. You know, they, they'll tell you. I, I usually get, you know, several paragraphs worth of comments from uh, reviewers about um, what, you know, this is, this, is a, this is a manuscript that has a lot of potential, but X, Y, and Z needs to be done. Next. So you get this revise and resubmit. Um, what do you do? Well, first you carefully attend to each issue that, that is raised by the reviewers and by the editor. Um, if you disagree, um, and it's usually not a good idea to disagree with too many things, you need to respectfully explain why. So if, if, if I send you a letter and, and I, uh, you know, between the reviewers and me, we identify, you know, 10 things that need to be done, um, coming back with a letter saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, is not a good idea. Um, you, you might, you know, disagree with one of the issues, um, and then you better have a really good explanation for why, because remember, the reviewers are, are well-established scholars um, in, in your field. So um, they, 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 yeah, I, I, I pick very carefully when I pick reviewers. Um, so they, they, their, their words are to be um, listened to. Um, so you follow the editor's letter regarding instructions, um, and, you, and you do all this without adding too much length to your article. Um, sometimes I'll get back uh, a manuscript that's, you know, a thousand words longer than it was initially. Well, that can't be. Um, we, we, have, we have word limits, and word limits need to be adhered to. So it's kind of a tricky thing to do, but it can be done. Next. So you revise and resubmit, um, and this is a letter that I do read. Um, in, in, you, you, you develop your, um, you, you revise your manuscript, and you also send back a cover letter. Um, and in this letter, you explain how you address each of the um, issues that the editor and the reviewers um, identified. If you don't agree, you explain why. Um, and you're polite. You thank the editor and reviewers for their comments because reviewers don't get paid. Reviewers do this out of, this is service to the community. Um, and so being respectful and thank, thanking the reviewers is, is, is very appropriate. Um, and note that the comments were helpful and proved the manuscript, even if you don't believe it. Again, you know, be polite. Do what your mom told you to do. Next. So this, I, I have this slide in here just to give you an idea of the sort of life course of, of peer-reviewed manuscripts. And, and, you know, sort of the takeaway here um, is that, that most of our um, manuscripts have, you know, go, go back and forth between the reviewer and the, between the author and the reviewer once, but twice is not uncommon. And there are some manuscripts that, you know, there are three, and, and if it gets to four, then we get a little bit nervous. Um, but again, it's a process, and, and you know, the, the, the science gets stronger because of the process. Okay, next. So, um, there's lots of opportunity when in, in, in manuscripts uh, submission to, for, for uh, rejection. So, um, you can also be rejected after the manuscript is reviewed. Now, so, so here, a decision is made based on what the reviewers have um, recommended to the editor. Um, so, again, so what you get here is you get, you get specific comments from the reviewers, and here the reviewers are saying things like there are some really serious problems here, um, and when I read these as the editor, I, I, I kind of conclude that this manuscript either it's not a good fit or there's so much that needs to be done and we just don't have the time to walk you through it. Um, so then the manuscript will be rejected. Next slide. So what do you do then? Well, so, so first do nothing, um, but simmer for a few days because you should never do anything when you're mad. Um, then you read the manuscript with a critical eye and consider alternative journals. And don't be afraid to try one with a higher impact factor. Um, the, 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 the next thing you do is you want to rewrite the manuscript for the new journal. And that doesn't mean just ship it off. Um, you need to go and read the in, instructions to authors. And you need to make sure that the manuscript is structured appropriately for the new journal. Um, and if you're smart, 
you'll take advantage of the reviews that you got from the gerontologist as you um, uh, revise the manuscript because um, gerontology is a small world and I wouldn't be surprised, and this happens all the time, if the, the second journal that you send it to sends it to the same reviewers that I sent it to. And reviewers, nothing pisses the reviewers off more than, I reviewed this for another journal and it's the exact same manuscript. When I hear that, it's like, forget it, dead in the water. Okay, next slide. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. That was wonderful insight to share with us today. And really, once again, thank you, thank you to all of our presenters today. Um, I, I have a couple questions and I've been a couple common themes that have come through the Q&A today. And one of the questions that I did not hear any of the presenters address today, and this is going to be obviously journal specific, so if you get that positive letter that your paper has been accepted to this journal, what is the publication lag for, for your journal? So how about, Becky, what is the publication lag for aging and mental health? Thank you, Lisa. Um, online publication is relatively rapid, but print publication can be a year later. So for example, um, if you receive an acceptance, then, and I'm going to give you a ballpark, don't quote me on this, but um, after an accepted uh, manuscript, you may be published online within 60 to 90 days, um, and then it may be 12 months before it comes out in print. Okay, Joe? You know, I think we're kind of in the same boat as aging and mental okay. health. I, uh, you know, our, our I, you know, when I took over as editor, we had a significant backlog. And then since I've been editor, the number of submissions has not quite doubled, but it's gone up quite a bit. And so we've been consistently upping the number of issues and the number of page limits, too. And it's a real balancing act between that and the impact factor, because one of the things that can occur is, if, if you have more uh, articles that are published in any given year, um, that means that you have a, a higher risk for your impact factor going down, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, but with that in mind, at the same time, you know, our, our publication to digital version and final digital form is very quick. It's probably within a month, uh, maybe even sooner at the point of acceptance. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that's where we're at in our journal. Okay, Rachel, what about you guys? Yeah, so um, I, I think that, that we're pretty similar. I think within weeks of acceptance, it is that the, an article is published online. Um, and I think it's really important for people to understand what that means. When an article is published online, it receives a DOI number, um, which means it's published, period, done. Um, in, in terms of when it, when it might appear in print, um, it, we're probably the, the worst of the journals. You know, we've got some... Um, some um, manuscripts that it's, it can take two years to appear in print, but that doesn't really matter because the article is, it's published, it's done, um, and, and, you know, it's available and people can see it. So, you know, I, I think that at some point um, in print um, is, is going to sort of be a dinosaur. Um, so, so, you know, I think that, that we're, we are able to, to publish things very, very quickly. Um, now, you know, certainly quicker than we ever could before we had online. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. So, um, now, one other question that I have is when, we sent, when you as an editor make the decision to send something out for peer review, is that based on reading the entire article or is that just looking at reading through the abstract or does it just depend on the situation? So, I'll start with Rachel. Sure. Um, yes. I read the whole article. I, I don't study the whole article. I read it. I, I'm looking for certain things. For example, I'm looking to make sure it's got a conceptual framework and, and that there, I'm, I'm taking a quick look at the measures, making sure that the, you know, the measures in the sample that, that, that are, are appropriate. Um, but I don't get lost in the weeds. I mean, that's the job of the reviewers to really pick the article apart and, and identify, you know, what, what kinds of problems it has. So, so if it, if it passes that, sort of initial cutoff, 
um, then I will send it out for review. Okay, Joe? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Rachel in terms of the approach. I, when I'm, as an editor, I don't approach submissions as I do a reviewer. Um, I, again, I, I focus more on overall quality and fit for the journal. And um, one, you know, in doing that, then that's when I kind of base my decision as to, as to whether I send the paper out or not for peer review. Mm -hmm. Okay, back, Keith? I agree with Joe and Rachel. Um, exactly the same, nothing to add. Okay. All right, and let me just remind our listeners on the phone, if you do have questions, please type them in the uh, Q&A icon on the bottom of the black bar. So one of the other questions that we received was about collaborative writing, and I know Jack, Becky and Joe have put some responses in, but do you have tips for uh, authors that are, tr that are engaging in this very normal collaborative writing process? Becky, we'll start with you. Yes, um, you know, online through the text, uh, Joe actually um, responded perfectly well and, and said that um, have the writing responsibilities straight up front. Um, when I was a graduate student in training, um, my mentor, Martha Strand, always had that conversation about order of authorship and who was responsible for writing what sections and how much. That needs to be a live and ongoing conversation because things shift in, when you're writing collaboratively in teams and those who put in the most work for any given manuscript should receive the most credit. That should be discussed up front with a plan and if that plan changes, then we just need to invest. Okay. Rachel or Joe, do you have anything to add with that or other tips for, the tri for our authors? No, I don't. I mean, I, I, I don't. I think it's, it's really a, an ongoing um, negotiation and, and um, um, conversation amongst the team. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, there's been some discussion on, with, with you all about the letters, and I'm just going to kind of lump them together. So when we come to the cover letter, I mean, Rachel, you were very honest and said, you don't, you don't read, really pay attention to the cover letter. What about the other um, editors? So, Joe, what about you? How important you know, is the cover letter? Yeah, I, we, you know, as part of, uh, I guess, our submission process, we ask for certain things in the cover letter, and I know other journals do this too, um, that we use to, you know, just assure, for example, I think we ask about um, the IRB number and things like that, uh, or human subjects uh, review and ethical kind of compliance in the cover letter so we kind of deal with it at that level certain journals do it differently um so yeah i i i, I kind of like rachel i can't say i pour over every cover letter but we do use it for at least administrative purposes okay and, and becky i also heard you say with the cover letter to make sure that it's addressed to the correct journal editor and the correct journal um do you have any other advice for a cover letter and how important are they is the content of the cover letter to for your journal well, for the initial submission, I agree with what um, Rachel and Joe have said, that it's sort of truthfully an attention check. Um, if you are submitting a journal article and aren't paying close enough attention to answer the questions about IRB number or um, address your correspondence to the correct editor, that bodes poorly for the success of your manuscript. Um, certainly, letters written in re uh, response to revision are much more closely attended to than the cover letter initially. Okay. Yeah, I definitely, go ahead, Rachel. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. The, the, um, w when you're revising a manuscript, the, the cover letter is very important. And it's the first thing that I read and the first thing that the reviewers read. Um, mm -hmm. you know, they they want to make sure that the, the issues were addressed. And so that's, this is your opportunity to say, yes, I heard you and here's what I did. Yeah, and kind of dovetailing on what Rachel said in part of her presentation, you know, and kind of what Becky just mentioned, I do use that. If, if I see that it's addressed to the wrong person in journal, my uh, antenna goes up because it, in all likelihood, this could very well be a paper that was just turned around and wasn't improved from a prior submission to another mm -hmm. journal. So, I mean, that's kind of one way to kind of, again, use as this whole gatekeeper role. Mm -hmm. Okay, Becky, thoughts? Oh, I, um, I think I answered earlier. 
Okay, I'm sorry that I'm getting confused here. Um, <laughs> But uh, I was going to say, as a reviewer, I look always look at that letter, the revise and resubmit letter, to see and you know I figure out which reviewer I was and see what the comments were. So as a as a journal editor, I guess one of my questions for you is, let's say reviewer number one tells the author to do X, and has them kind of take the article in a slightly different. Slant, maybe repackage something, do some stati new statistical analysis, and reviewer number two says this is just great this way, or in a later revision tells them to take it out. What is the what is, what is what should an author be doing at that point, and how should they be interfacing with you and handling those situations? So conflicting off conflicting reviewer comments. Yeah, so so I'll take that one first. So so I think you know first it's important to understand that. Reviewers make recommendations and editors make decisions. So they're, they're very different. So, so reviewers are not making decisions about the manuscript. They, they just advise the editor. Um, so when I get um, reviews, one reviewer says, you know, uh, make X, Y, and Z changes, and the other one, if, if there's a, 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 a difference in sort of the message, I will then advise the author. So I'll say, um, uh, you know, pay special attention to reviewer one's comment about the methods, or pay special attention to reviewers' uh, comment to, to attention comments about you know what something else. Um, but what really strikes me as an editor is how often um, the the two review we, we we have two reviewers for each manuscript, at least two, sometimes three if there's a if there's a extenuating circumstances. But but it always amazes me how consistent the uh, comments from reviewers are. Um, but but when it's not, then it's my job as the editor to advise the author, you know, to who they should listen to. Okay, uh, Joe, Becky. Go ahead, Becky. Okay, Joe, I agree with uh, what Rachel said, and and I think as a, an editor, I really like that um, reviewers make suggestions and editors make decisions. We choose our reviewers very carefully, and they are. Um, experts in a particular field of relevance to the topic that the manuscript addresses. And if one of my two, possibly three, usually two, mm -hmm. reviewers um, has a significant issue with a, a manuscript methodology or lack of conceptual model or lack of uh, implications for the field, I pay really close attention to that. And it's um, uncommon if one of my reviewers has concerns that I don't um, decide that those need to be addressed. Yeah, I, I agree with all these points and they're excellent ones. You know, I, and I'm gonna switch hats here and think of it as from an author standpoint. You know, I, it, this hasn't happened very often, but you know, in the past, and, and in this one case, it was actually a very good journal outside of the gerontology discipline, it was another discipline. And, um, you know, the editor in a way just kind of let the review kind of go on and never really inserted herself or himself. And so we ended up going through like three revisions where after the first revision, it appeared that we were close to getting it accepted. Then either a new reviewer was added or something happened with the reviewer. And this kind of, kind of went back and forth and there was all this inconsistency and the editor never really stepped in and said, okay, you know, this is what I would like to see etc to kind of move this paper on and hopefully you can address this the editor never did that and eventually after multiple revisions it ended up getting rejected and I really felt as an author that if I ever had the opportunity either as a reviewer or as editor um, I would never allow that to happen and I think you heard from Becky and Rachel who both have excellent editorial skills they wouldn't either mm -hmm. yeah. and Joe you brought up a good thing or a good point about the revision process and sometimes new reviewers get added. Um, so editors, is that something that you try to avoid? Yeah, so I, I certainly do. I think that whenever I can, well, we always go back to the initial reviewers. And what sometimes happens is that the one of the initial reviewers is not available. Um, uh, and again, you, we, you know, we have to remember that reviewers do this. This is a, a gratis kind of thing. So they may have a grant proposal due or they may have, you know, something going on in their family um, and they just can't get to it. Um, but so, so whenever possible, we do go back to the initial reviewers. Um, when the initial reviewer is not 
available, then we have to, we have to find somebody new. And so the, the plea that I will make to people listening is that if you, if you do review for journals, um, you know, it's a commitment <laughs> uh, because you would want your work to be reviewed by the same person. I mean, this only makes sense, right? So if, if, if you're a reviewer and you have XYZ problems and the author fixes XYZ problems, um, and you're not available to, 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 to put your stamp of it's okay now. And so the editor has to go get a new reviewer who's going to say ABC now is a problem. Um, so, so, you know, it's, it's to author's benefits to have the same reviewers involved. And, you know, we try whenever possible to use the same reviewers. Um, yeah. And the only thing I would add to, um, what Joe and Rachel have already said is um, at Aging and Mental Health, we do try to only have one round of uh, external reviews if possible. Now, of course, any manuscript has different sort of layers or levels. Um, it's very, very rare to be accepted outright. You might be accepted with minor or major revisions or get a revise and resubmit. And uh, at Aging and Mental Health, revise and resubmit is, well, you sneaked in under the wire and a cracked window, um, but there's some significant work to be done. So typically we will send um, those kind of manuscripts back out for a review, but if we can, uh, just in order to expedite the process, the editors try to handle like, um, you know, maybe major revisions uh, at the editorial level. Okay. Well, and that definitely eliminates getting some of those reviewers back. Um, do you, do, Rachel or Joe, do you guys, you send, I know Rachel, you send articles out for multiple revisions to the reviewers. Um, Joe, what is the process with your journal? It, it's the same. And, uh, you know, there are some instances, and I, honestly, as an editor, I never, even as a reviewer, I never quite well, I'll take that back. Basically, yeah, it's the same the same issue. We do our best to try to maintain continuity with the reviewers. For whatever reasons, there may be instances where that doesn't occur. If that's the case, try to be um, as transparent as possible with the newly invited reviewers about where the paper is and what we would expect from the subsequent reviews. Um, it's just one of those issues as an editor, editors you, you can't always avoid, but uh, yeah, well, that's what we really try to do. Okay. Well, so let me ask you all as um, editors, how does somebody become a reviewer down the road or now, depending on their stage of career development? So the gerontologist, the, the gerontologist encourages um, new emerging, emerging scholars to get involved in the review process. There, there's nothing like um, being a reviewer to strengthen your own work. Um, and so one of the things, there, there are a couple of ways that, that um, young scholars can get involved. And one is to go into the Scholar One system that we use, um, just like um, Becky's journal. I don't, I don't know if Joe's journal uses Scholar One, but go into the Scholar One system and just sign up as a novice reviewer. We have that, you can, you can just you know, put your information in, you put your name in, you put your affiliation in, you put your keywords in, which is really, really important. Um, because when I'm looking for a reviewer, I use the Scholar One database um, and I, I'll look for a, you know somebody who knows something about you know by, by topic. Um, so the, the the more appropriate keywords you can put in, the better. Um, and then you identify yourself as a novice reviewer. Um, and you know if I have a paper in your area, um, I may call on you to review it. And then once an individual has done two reviews as a novice reviewer, um, we we take the novice off of them, and they're just in our database like everybody else. Um, another way that um, emerging scholars can get involved as reviewers of the gerontologist is to work with your mentor. Um, we encourage senior scholars, if we send them a manuscript, to consider working with a junior scholar. Um, and sometimes people will, like, have a graduate student, um, you know, take you know, do an independent read of a paper, and then the, the two, the, the, the mentor and the scholar will, the junior scholar will, will discuss it, and then you know, one review is submitted from that team. Because um, we, in our checklist, we always ask whether um, uh, uh, the, the review was done in, you know, conjunction with somebody else. So there are, you know, two ways that, and, and, and again, we really encourage um, people to get involved as graduate students, as, you know, young faculty. Um, it's, it's never too, you, you know, once you're a graduate student, it's, it's time to really start thinking about um, being a reviewer. Okay. Becky, how does someone become a reviewer for aging and mental health? Well, 
excellent question. And um, I do really love, I'm going to say this out loud, the system that the gerontologist has where you can um, go through the Scholar One system and um, add um, junior colleagues who are helping review a manuscript. Um, we do not have that uh, more formal system in um, uh, aging and mental health. However, uh, we do encourage um, graduate students and, and um, young um, professionals to review manuscripts. And um, one of the ways that you can do that is similarly to what Rachel described, you know, exactly what Rachel described, go in through Scholar One and sign up. Um, be careful about your keywords. Again, that's what we'll all be looking for. Or um, you can always email myself or one of the other editors at Aging and Mental Health. Um, you know, for the Americas, I would be I would be the person you want to talk to, and um, and I can um, I can definitely hook you up. We're always looking for reviewers. Okay, thank you. So, Joe, how do we become a, a reviewer for you? Yeah, it's all the same. We do use Scholar One Manuscript as well, and you know, people are encouraged to sign up. And you know, in contrast to what I mentioned before about, you know, sending uh, me an abstract or something is if, if people do just email me directly and say, I would love to be a reviewer and here's my areas of interest, you're added to the reviewer list. And I mean, we welcome that very much. So um, that's, that's another way. And I, I, I think many editors would welcome that too. Yeah. Well, one of the other comments I want to make is that um, when we do have a novice reviewer who, who's re reviewing a paper, that reviewer is in addition to the, usual two reviewers. So if there is a novice reviewer, an author would get the comments from three reviewers. Um, and what's really very interesting is, is my experience when I do have a novice reviewer on a paper, um, that review is usually the best review of the three. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, well, one last question I want to ask, and then I'm going to give you each give me a, an opportunity to give me your last thoughts for the day. One question that comes through was about impact factors, and I know Joe has answered this online, but for those who haven't been checking the Q&A, what is a reasonable impact factor? So if you're looking for a journal, you know, what, what criteria should people be looking, and how should they evaluate that number? So we'll start with Joe, please. Yeah, I provided a written answer to this question online, and, um, you know, I've had colleagues here at the University of Minnesota say things like, you know, and and this is someone outside of nursing or behavioral social science, say things like, well, if a journal has an impact factor under one, it really doesn't exist, and I think that was kind of harsh. Um, you know, obviously, all of us would like to publish in all, all of our work in the top-tier journals with the highest impact factor. Clearly, we all want that, and that would be wonderful. But so much of this depends is dependent on discipline and where and how your field um, views a given journal. Um, some journals I know have impact factors under one, but would be seen as very acceptable places to disseminate work um, because, uh, you know, for example, they could be a society journal, they could be a journal that's uh, a shared outlet for a given group of professionals or a subfield of professionals. And with that in mind, you know, those are perfectly acceptable places to be published. Like I mentioned in my slides, yes, impact factor is important, but at the same time, I think it's just as important to know and, and understand if I publish in this given journal, will this journal have, be listed and, and will this article be accessible to others on key scientific databases, other search uh, mechanisms that would allow my work to uh, be recognize and, and hopefully be cited by others in, in my discipline or beyond. I think that's just as important as impact factor. Okay, thank you. Any other thoughts on impact factor, Rachel, Rachel or Becky? Yeah, I do. I, I, first, I'd like to say that there are, um, there are other metrics that I think are even more important, especially for um, somebody publishing for the first time. And I would encourage you to think about things like, how long does it take to get a paper reviewed, and how long is the process at this journal? Um, especially for you know people that are that are worried about getting tenure, um, you know you might have a, a you know an impact factor, a journal with a, with, a, with a really high impact factor, but if it if it takes two years to get this thing accepted, you probably don't have that kind of time. So I would I would encourage you to to think about other metrics. I would also encourage you to think about the acceptance rate. 
Um, you know, I think the goal for somebody starting out is not to publish in a, in a, in a really high impact factor. It's just to get a publication in a reputable journal. Um, and, and, and I say reputable journal because, you know, one of the things I want to caution people about is there are so many um, not reputable journals that are being published in somebody's basement in China or India. So I, I really encourage you to be very, very careful about the about where you send your manuscripts. Um, I, I'm not saying that online only journals are a problem, um, but but I I think that you really have to you know every day I must get a half dozen you know publish in my journal emails um, and 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 most of these are from from you know journals that I've never heard of that you know they're they're collecting fees and and they are again in somebody's basement and there's no peer review. I think what's most important is you want your work peer-reviewed in a reputable journal. Okay, I, thank you, Rachel. Becky? And I agree with what um, Rachel and Joe have said. The um, other thing that I would add is you uh, want to think about fit and readership. And this mm -hmm. relates back to um, some of what both of uh, Joe and, and Rachel have said, but if you are um, getting yourself known, say, in clinical um, geropsychology, well, um, there may be um, particular journals that will give you more bang for the buck that would not have the highest impact factor, but would still um, provide a really good avenue to um, start networking and get your work out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. So we are winding down at this. I'd like to go to each of the editors and ask them the one biggest piece of advice they have for everybody. So we'll start with Rachel. Um, one piece of advice is read the instruction to authors and, and know your journal. I would have predicted you were going to say that based on your presentation. So, okay. <laughs> that, that, Dr. Allen, what would you say? The biggest piece of advice? Be very careful, very careful in submitting your response to reviewer comments, your revise and resubmit. Be sure that you address the comments. Be sure that you actually do provide comments um, and that you follow the instructions that are provided to you from the journal. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Joe? Yeah, and uh, I think this dovetails with a lot of what we talked about today, but I, I think always to keep in mind, and it's hard to do this when we're so focused on quote unquote productivity and quote unquote outputs and stuff, but I think all great science, regardless of discipline, is a process. And similarly, when one is submitting and disseminating their work, it's very much a process as well. And as was mentioned earlier, we've all suffered through rejections. We've all suffered through difficult review, pro review experiences. But taking and, and, and getting wisdom and obtaining wisdom from that and then applying it to our work moving ahead, whether it's the current project or subsequent ones, I think that's key to not only disseminating great work, but becoming a, a good scholar. Great. Well, I want to once again thank our speakers today. They are phenomenal editors, and they gave us a lot of great information today that we can apply to our work starting immediately. So once again, thank you, Joseph Galger, Dr. Rebecca Allen, Dr. Rachel Pruchno, and then I'd like to thank my colleagues at the University of Washington, Dr. Basha Belza and Gwen Moni for coordinating this webinar today. And if you are registered for this webinar, you will receive a link to the webinar and the archive. So thank you so much for participating, and we look forward to um, reading your work in a journal soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.